thanks to you, Ian, to your minister, and to you folks for uh, the invitation to come and share in your gospel service this evening. It's good to be back here again. It's not my first time to be here, and, uh, uh, but I'm delighted to be here and to share in this meeting with you. And I've been looking forward to it. It's been booked now for quite some time. Uh, and even though my life has changed and the circumstance of my life has changed, this is certainly one booking that I had no uh, interest whatsoever in cancelling. So I'm glad to be here and I'm looking forward to what the Lord will do and uh, say through us this evening. So thank you very much, Ian and Hazel, for allowing me to sit beside you. I know the man's wife, but then it's good to be here. And we trust that whatever we have to say will uh, have uh, something very definite into your hearts. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing us together here this evening. And Lord, thank you for the glorious message of the gospel that Jesus saves. We thank you for that amazing grace that John Newton wrote about all those years ago. Uh, Lord, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Lord, that not everyone that's here that's saved is a miracle of your grace. And not only are they a miracle of your grace, but they are a triumph of your grace. Lord, we didn't save ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't, Lord, change uh, the direction and the destiny of our lives. But, Lord, you stepped in. And, Lord, you won the affections of our hearts, and we've been redeemed by precious blood. You paid that great cost, that great price, that we might be forgiven. And, our Father, we pray that by your gracious Holy Spirit you will come and make these lips of clay as a messenger of grace to every heart, we pray. And grant, Lord, that in this gathering uh, men and women and young people may become very aware of the Lord's presence and speaking voice. Uh, Father, we pray that you'll make it real, make it new, make it fresh. Lord, make it something real and make it relevant, we ask. And grant, O oh God, that we will leave this place saying it was good for here not to be here, not because we heard of a man's story. Because, Lord, our, my story is your story. It's what you have done in my life, where you brought me from, what you brought me to, what you have done within me, what you are continuing to do. Dear gracious God, I pray that you'll bless us as we read, as we listen to, and as we recount and recall the things and the, the workings of God in our heart, we pray. And so we ask your help. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Titus in chapter 2. Titus in chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 11 down to verse 15. My testimony is, uh, I often think of my life and where it was and where it was going. uh, Where I was headed and what I was uh, listening to and what I was involved in. And I can only explain my, my life and my conversion through the amazing by the amazing grace of God. It's grace of God that lifted me out of the doldrums of sin and out of depravity and of darkness and despair and hopelessness and a sense of hopelessness and a sense of weakness. It was the amazing grace of God that met me at the very point of my need. And uh, I want to tell you folks, I haven't got over it yet. And I have no intention of getting over it because God did a work of grace in my life and has given me a real meaning and purpose. Uh, and that's what he does. He gives you a meaning and purpose in your life uh, to, to uh, live out your life for him. Titus chapter 2, uh, reading from verse 11, and here's what it says. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that many of you will remember us being here before and maybe some of you have heard my testimony before, but there's always a few bits and pieces to add to Uh, in how the Lord has dealt with us right up until this point in life. Uh, My name is Trevor Galanders, and I'm uh, now pastor over in the Kulibaki Elam Church, and along with Esther and myself, we're serving the Lord there. But I didn't and was not born in Balamina. I was born south of the border, not exactly down Mexico way, but down Monaghan way, uh, just three miles from the border, born into a family of 11 children, six girls and five boys. And I was the fourth youngest of that family. 
We had nothing of this world's goods and we had no interest in the things of God, though we might have went to church now and again to keep the minister happy, to keep mother happy, and to keep the people from talking that we were complete heathens altogether. And so we would have went to church on the odd occasion when we would get a lift. Mind you, when you've got 11 children, it's not easy to get into church, especially when it's five miles away. You're depending on a lift, and if you didn't get a lift, you had to walk. And mind you, five miles is a fair way you walk whenever you're only three or four years of age. And so we were brought up to think that uh, God was away up there, we were down here, he had no interest in us, we had no interest in him. The minister was away up there and he had no interest in us and we had no interest in him either. That's exactly how we're, we're brought up. Even though we're brought up as Presbyterians and we wouldn't have said boot to a goose with a polished of shoes on a Saturday night because that's what Presbyterians did 60 odd years ago. They would have said their prayers and wiped their nose and uh, whatever it is, combed their hair. Uh, but that's exactly what we would have done on a Saturday night. But uh, with all of that, uh, no interest in the Lord. I, I can remember some, some little memories that I, I want to, uh, to tell you just to give you an idea of, of where I come from and just how ungodly we were. Uh, whenever I was about four or five years of age, my brother Ian, who has now since gone to glory, and that's a triumph of God's grace right there, that my brother Ian got saved. And that's another story. But nevertheless, our minister used to tell us that we would be visiting certain townlands or uh, uh, addresses. He would tell us on a Sunday that he would be visiting certain areas. Now, we lived in Fadu, which is just a little townland in, in Monaghan. And when the minister would stand up in the pulpit on a Sunday morning, he said, I shall be visiting Fadu on a Tuesday at half past two. He said it a lot more politely than I've said it. And uh, so at half past two, uh, he used to drive a bright, light, lime green Hillman Hunter. Now, there's some of you boys, you'll probably remember what a Hillman Hunter looked like. Does anybody remember the Hillman Hunters? Put up your hand. You've got the early age pension as well, haven't you? Because they were way back then. Well, he, brought a, he drove a light, bright, lime green Hillman Hunter. And my brother Ian used to paint me with little red spots when the minister was a Jew to come to our house. And we lived up on a bit of a hill and there's a crossroads you could see from our house which was about five minutes drive from where we lived. You had to come on these narrow little roads. And by the time he got to the foot of our lane, Ian, my brother, had me wheeled in the wheelbarrow down to the foot of the lane. The minister would see these little red... This is true. This is definitely true. Uh, the minister would see me covered in little red spots. He'd say, what's wrong with Trevor? Chicken pox. And he would home to the manse where he belonged. We didn't want him next nor near us. We had no interest in him or anything he had to say. He was away up there. We were away down here. Neither of the twain should ever meet. We had absolutely no interest. And uh, to be honest with you, it wouldn't have made any difference because all he ever did was talk about the weather. And that he never ever challenged us about the gospel. Don't believe he was a saved man, but he was a nice man. When I was about 16 years of age, I bought my first motorbike. Uh, I bought it on HP. Does anybody know what HP is around here? And before some smart Alex says it's it's, uh, HP sauce, it was on, what was it? Yes, and you know what it means? You know what HP means? It means it will never be yours. Because the time it's paid for, it's done, and you had to buy a new motorbike. I, I was absolutely crazy, mad on that motorbike. It only did one speed, and that was flat out. I only broke the speed limit once when I was going up past it. And then when I was slowing down, coming down past it again. I was as mad as a, as, as a hatter. Uh, my wife describes me when she first met me as a long, scrawny, scrawny-haired looking article. Uh, she, she needed to go to Specsavers, to be honest with you. Uh, I used to dress in all these big tight leathers, and I used to think that I was hell's angel. Well, I probably was, by the way. Uh, and that, I used to teach the young people to sm- how to smoke at school and at Sunday school. That's about as far away from God that I was. Mind you, before you get a wee bit uh, t- too critical, smoking and things like that aren't the only sins that people commit. You can be full of pride, you can be full of hypocrisy, you can be full of self-righteousness, you can be full of all sorts of things, but that was my life. I bought this motorbike when I was about 15, left school when I was 14, smoked my first cigarette, by the way, when I was five. Exactly right, I was hooked when I was five and a half. 
And tell you how that happened. My father was very fond of drink and smoke and all of that thing and alcohol and whatever else uh, that kind of lifestyle uh, led. And his mates used to come home with him and used to sit me on their knee when I was five. And they'd take a wee drag, Trevor. And I was dragging at Woodbines. Does anybody remember the Woodbines? Ten times as strong as Gallagher's man. I tell you, the tar was dropping out of them. And that's what I started on my smoke. And I was absolutely hurt. If you wanted me to do anything when I was five years of age, because we lived on a little farm, all, all you had to do was offer me a fag. And I would clean out the byre, or the fold the cattle, or the fed the pigs, or the weeded the grass, whatever. You name it, I'd have done it. That was me. So, uh, I, bought my, I, I drank my first pint of Smithwick when I was 15. I'm not proud of any of this, by the way. I'm not proud of it, but that's my lifestyle. When I was about 15 or 16, I drank my first pint of Smithwick. I thought I'd seen the world. The world was my oyster. I had a motorbike, I had an HP, I had a, a, a pint of Smithwick, and I thought this was great fun. At the back of Long Nancy's pub, was where I used to drink my, my, uh, go with my mates, uh, there was a big uh, sharp hill at the back of Long Nancy's uh, pub, and the back of, that's between Monaghan and Middletown. Uh, by the way, uh, between uh, Armagh and Middletown, by the way. And at the foot of that hill, there was a humpback bridge, and the other side of the humpback bridge, there was a sharp, cor- sharp corner. This was our means of fun. Nowadays, you've got all sorts of online gaming, and you've got uh, Xboxes and whatever else. Well, we had a motorbike and a pint of smithics. So that's what we had. And we used to tear down that hill as fast as the motorbike would travel, flat out. And we would hit the humpback bridge, and we, had, uh, we, we were uh, absolutely flying. And when she hit that humpback bridge, the motorbike was, I was uh, airborne without a pilot's license. And here's where the fun was. That wasn't the fun now. The fun was that you had to land the motorbike on her side. Because if you didn't land her on her side, you'd be going over a hedge into a precipice. Now, I don't know how far and how deep that precipice was. It could have been anything from 20 to 30 feet. And if we'd have gone over the hedge and down to the precipice, more than likely would have been wiped out into eternity. There seemed to be no fear of eternity, no fear of death. And I'll say this to you before I go any further. At the end of, at the last verse of Hebrews chapter 1, here's what the Bible says. He shall give his angels charge over those who shall be heirs of salvation. Many of the time I came off that motorbike. I can remember one time when I was working in Dinkins Bakery, I was a baker by trade, and I was coming into this kind of a chicane, kind of a corner, it was a bridge, a kind of a strange chicane, because it was a bridge as well as a chicane. It was a sharp corner to the right, and then a sharp corner to the left, and then a sharp corner to the right again. And I was coming, tearing up the road a bit as fast as this motorbike would go, and in the middle of that bridge, there was a lorry stopped dead in the middle of it. And I was flying. Well now, if you know anything about motorbikes, there's only two wheels on the ground. And when there's been a rain, there's very little traction. And I was flying, and all I could see was that if I try to put on the brakes, my motorbike will go out of, out of control. And if I, uh, if I do go out of control, uh, and if I don't do something, I'm going to be headless, physically. Uh, I can remember coming up, and, and a last minute, a last minute decision... I put the motorbike down on her side and I slid onto the, onto the lorry. And I come out on the other side, put the motorbike up on her wheels again, and all went home again. And that is, this is true. I can still see it happening. But again I say, the Lord had his hand. God had a purpose for my life. God had something he wanted me to do. God had preserved me. He did give his angels charge over those who shall be heirs of salvation. He kept his hand. I'll tell you how else he kept his hand. He kept his hand on me from going too far down into sin. Well, I did drink the... I I didn't do drugs and I didn't do other stuff. I didn't do heroin and I'm thankful to God. And I pray for those who do because they are tremendously in bondage to those kind of things. Well... Rushing along to the next stage in my life, whenever I first clapped eyes on Esther, Queen Esther. Do you know that uh, she's my queen? Uh, yes, she's number one. Uh, she was the best looking thing that ever put, laid eyes on. And, and by the way, you probably think that you're, be- look, you're married to the best looking woman in Ireland. Is that true? Well, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Isn't that right, Ian? Uh, and so we fell in love and within. Hold on to your seatbelts. We were married within six months. I wore down her resistance and she said yes. 
I asked her to marry me on the first date, and she said yes on our third date. It's not working. If you want to know how that works, boys, ask me after the meeting. All right. And so there we were. We got married. We bought our first house. Our first house was in, in uh, well, our first apartment was on, on Glass Law Street in Monaghan. And then after three years or four years, we moved from that flat into a house which we bought ourselves. We just passed it the other day. It is wonderful memories for us, the day that we fell in love with Jesus in number 24 Tully in Monaghan. Well, we were due our second son, Raymond, was on the way. And you probably know this bit of the story. And of course, our first son was hale and healthy. And our second son, surely, or our second child, surely would be the same. But whenever Raymond was born, he was born with three holes in his heart. He was born with an enlarged heart and an enlarged liver. And he was born with other, some very, very severe complications. Our little boy was born uh, very, very ill indeed. And to cap it all, he also had Down syndrome. And so our hearts were broken and breaking for our little boy who didn't seem to be going to have any opportunity uh, in to have a normal life. There's two ways that you can go whenever you have a child born to you with severe illness. You can get hard and bitter against God. As I stand here, I know of one man who is very bitter towards God because he had a child that had a severe disease and the treatment of that disease ruined the child's life and the disease would have killed the child. She's alive but badly badly affected by the treatment. You can get bitter. You can get angry with God. You can, you can point the finger and shake your fist at God because of the circumstances that happen in your life and God is, is, is locked out of your heart and the things that God wants to do for you are, are, are so far away they're with beyond reach. Well, Raymond lived for 17 years in our wee house. We loved him. You look at me when I said this because I don't think you could love a child any more than we loved him. We absolutely adored him. Our lives were lived for him. Our one son, Darren, uh, was about three at that time, going on four. He, he used to remind us, Raymond was, he, he had pneumonia, Esther says 17 times because he lived 17 months and he was in hospital 17 times, two weeks of every month he was in hospital because he had had pneumonia. The pneumonia came about because the holes in his heart used to leak blood into his lungs and that's what gave him pneumonia. He also had heart failure five times and he had a very shallow breathing and some of you people probably have your own side of the bed. Well, Esther and I at that time, we had to alternate because whoever was on duty had to sleep very lightly to hear him breathing. Here's how he breathed. For 17 months. Now, I've described to you a happy-go-lucky kind of individual with long hair and motorbikes and all that kind of stuff. And I've described to you, you would know that if we hadn't. It, it almost seemed as if we hadn't a care in the world. And now we're living with death. Now we're being brought into reality. Folks, we're not here to stay. We're here to go. And we don't know when we're going to pop our clogs, close our eyelids in death and cease to exist in this state of, of eternity. We don't know. Some day young, some day old, some day healthy, some day unhealthy, some day happy, some day unhappy, but we're all a dying breed. In a hundred years from now, every one of us will be gone. In fifty years, most of us will be gone. In ten of years, some of us may be gone. We're not here to stay. We're here to go. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I believe, here's what I believe. I believe that the gospel's for the whosoever. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the light that lighteneth every man that cometh into the world. 
And I also believe that the Spirit of God works in the heart of every man to bring him to, to faith in Jesus Christ. And what we can do, one or two things, we can cloud out and block out the Word of God to our hearts and the voice of God, or we can hear and heed and respond to it. The choice is yours. Choice is yours. Many a time, Esther used to ring me, Trevor, Raymond's heart's in failure. Now, this is a wee bit of a raw, this touches a wee raw nerve with me and try and understand why I say it in the way I say it. We were never once offered an ambulance to bring Raymond to hospital. Never once. The, the, the road from, from Monaghan to Drogheda was where the hospital that used to deal with Raymond's condition, because it was a specialist hospital and there's a specialist heart uh, award in that particular hospital, it was 54 miles away. It took us an hour and 10 minutes to get to that hospital. On five occasions, I had Raymond in my little blue Hillman Avenger racing up the road trying to save his life. And it seemed as if the authorities and the medical people didn't care. Brought him to Dublin uh, to discover what his condition was. And Dublin told us that Raymond would live to his five years of age. We took them at their word. He would live to his five. Because we thought they knew. Isn't it interesting how much confidence we put on men? And how little confidence we put in the God of heaven? We thought he'd lived to his five. So we raced up and down the hospital up to Dohada. How did you know that his, little, uh, he was, his heart was in failure? His skin would be in little red prickles, his lips would be blue and be coughing up blood. And his shallow breathing would be even more shallow. Remember the last time that Raymond was alive in our house? Esther had phoned us, phoned me, I was at work. And uh, I needed to come home immediately. Raymond's heart was in failure. We knew it. You could see it. You could hear it. We were used to it. By the way, you can get used to sickness as well. And, and the, the means and the method that God is seeking to speak into your heart can become the, the means that hardens your heart. People have done that with the gospel. Sometimes God allows sickness to speak to us. Sometimes God allows tragic circumstance to speak to us. But we can harden our hearts towards God in those circumstances. Well, Esther had called me. Raymond's heart was in failure. I rushed home from work. Raymond was sitting in a little white rug. He was propping himself up. He's now uh, almost 17 months. He's Actually, he is 17 months at this stage. And his little lips are blue. His skin is red prickles, blue pickles. And his shallow breathing and as I was rushing up and down the sitting room trying to get these old flowery clothes off that were used at the bakery, Raymond's eye caught my eye and God spoke to me through a, through a little child. And that's why the book was called A Little Child Shall Lead Them. And here's what God said to me through the look of a child. And I want to tell you, it's over 40 years ago and it's as plain as if it only happened today. What are you rushing around for? What's life all about? I was stunned. What was I rushing around for? What's life all about? I'd never thought of that. The possibility that God could have a purpose with my life, for my life. The possibility that God was seeking admission into my life so that he could get me on the right road, not just to get to heaven. That's, that's a, a secondary event. That's a, second, that's a consequence of salvation. But God was seeking to gain access into my life, to have fellowship with him, and to bring me back to the purpose for which he created me. And if you know anything about the Presbyterian Catechism, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 
So God was beginning to show me his purpose for my life. That I wasn't here just to enjoy myself and to satisfy and gratify the lust of my flesh. But God had actually created me for a purpose. Can I say this to you? God has created you for a purpose. He is something he wants from you, for you, to do through you. And the devil stole that purpose. As by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death has passed upon all men in that all have sinned. And that's not just physical death but it's death to the reality and fellowship with God. And I'm having a, a huge and a very instant lesson as I look at the, at, into the eyes of my dying son which I didn't realize at that point because this was only another time and the many times it already had taken place. Anyway, we got him into the car. We got him into Drogheda, as was our custom. Got him into the little ward. We knew exactly where to go. We knew exactly what cot to put him into. And the nurses and the doctors. But this last time was a wee bit different. A wee bit different. We got him inside his little oxygen tent. And you can see the life coming back into his eyes. And... You can see his skin improving and you can see his energy returning. And he looked up at us and he said, "Uh, uh, I'll I'll try and hold it together when I tell you this. Whenever we was inside the little tent, he smiled at us. He's 17 months now. And he put his little hand up on the inside of the tent. And we put our hand up on the outside. And Raymond lay down and went to sleep. We stayed with him till 12.30 that night. I don't know if you know anything about the Republic of Ireland, but we were, when you've got a sick child for 17 months, all your money, all your funds, all your finance go toward the, up to the treatment of that little child. We were being threatened to be cut off with the the equivalent to your NIE, which was the ESB. We were six months in arrears in a mortgage and been threatened to be evicted. And so I had to go home to work. We stayed to 12.30 that night. And about four miles from home, we ran out of petrol because we had no money to put petrol into the car. Pushed the car into a man by the name of Oni McCarville who gave us five pounds worth of petrol free on tick that night and never looked for it back. I went to work the next morning. Esther kept in touch with, from our neighbour's phone with the doctors. Uh, Raymond's, as usual, he's recovering. He's doing well. His energies are turned. His bloods are coming normal. As normal as I could, I suppose. Then about four o'clock, I had just about finished, managed to get finished work. Before five o'clock, I can remember uh, Esther uh, phoned Flemings. She knew that I would be changing my work check uh, in Flemings because I didn't have a bank account way back in those days. And Jacqueline, my sister, came running through Flemings. Trevor, you need to get home, Esther's looking for you. Uh, What had happened was the hospital had rang Esther to say that Raymond's condition had deteriorated. We needed to get home as quickly as we could. Well, when I got home, got Esther into the car, we were rushing up the road. Esther was praying, Lord, I know he's dying, but please let him live till we get there. When we got into Drogheda Hospital, we went straight to the little tent that we left him in the night before in the little ward in which we'd left him. And Raymond was laying cold and still. He'd passed into eternity. And we weren't there. We had a son that needed looked after. Bills we needed to meet. And I want to tell you, the bottom fell out of our world. What would it take for the bottom to fall out of your world? Eh? Failed an exam. Broken relationship. Bad news from the doctor. 
What would it take? The bottom fell out of our world. When we got home uh, to our house in, in, in Monaghan, there was about a hundred people at our house. I, I, I don't know how they came. Well, of course, when you come from eleven family of 11 plus spouses, that's 22, plus 3.5 children, that's a right few people. About 100 people in the house. Five days later, sorry, four days later, the funeral was arranged. And I can remember uh, very, very vividly the Reverend David Hillen, who lives now in Limavati and a very close friend of mine still. He preached at that funeral service a little child shall lead them. And I can remember it as plainly as if it only was yesterday. He sought to try and explain to the congregation that perhaps God was trying to break into this young family's life, that he had a purpose and a plan for them. And God was seeking by way of using this circumstance to bring them to himself. Did God make Raymond sick so that we would get saved? No. I won't answer that question right away. But God uses the circumstances in our lives to turn them around for his good, for our good and for his glory. He will take the sad and the difficult circumstances in your life and if you allow him He'll turn them around for his glory. And that's exactly what he did. I can remember then going to the grave with the little remains of our little son. Have you ever wondered what's in the mind of a young father, young couple, as they're carrying the remains of a little infant that they had loved intensely and intently, and they're letting his remains down into the ground? Do you ever wonder what goes through the mind of a father and a mother? Well, here's what was in my mind. Son, I know where you're going. I don't know where I'm going to. That troubled me. But I managed to get through the funeral. I managed to get through the remainder of the next days. And remember, get through the next weeks and months. But... Now there was, there was something stirring in my heart because those two events around Raymond's life were troubling me. Daddy, what are you rushing around for? What's life all about? And, and, and I know where you're going, going, but where am I going to? And for 22 months, you'd have found me walking, not every night, but oftentimes walking the fields at four, five, or six o'clock in the morning. You might have seen me shaking my fist at God, or you might have heard me crying or shouting, and you'd have said that if you were standing in the other side of the hedge looking in, you'd have said that poor man lost his mind when his son died, and he'll never be the same again. But I was asking questions. I was trying to make sense of the trauma that we'd just come through. And uh, I wanted to know the reality of God at the same time. And so, I, met, I suppose I'd asked the Lord into my life about a hundred times over that period, but at no point was there any reality of what I had professed or had sought. But I can remember the night that I was converted. It was an Wednesday night in November in 1983. So it was about 40 years, not 44 years, it was 40 years. Raymond was dead two years before that, so it was 42 years since he passed away. I was at home, Esther, and I had become foster parents. Esther was with a foster parenting plus plan, which, in other words, she would have interviewed and uh, had given advice to future foster parents. And I was in the house, and for some reason the television was off, and I was a television addict, but for some reason the television was off, and I was listening to Jim Reeves. Do you know Jim Reeves? It was, a, it, was a, it was a gospel LP by Jim Reeves. It was the, the name of the LP was We Thank Thee 
And on that LP there were two songs. Have thy known way, Lord. Have thy known way. And the other song was, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. And I can only tell you that the Holy Spirit came into our room very clearly and very powerfully. And I listened to that record. I just put the, the, the old vinyl LP player. I used to just put the arm down and play the two songs, let it play the two songs, put it back, play the two songs, put it back. You can, nowadays you have good gadgets to play repeat, but that was the only gadget that I had was my arm and this old vinyl LP player. For a long time that night, these two songs gripped my heart. I'd rather have Jesus and silver or gold. I'd rather be his and the riches and told. Have thy known way, Lord, have thy known way. And it goes on to say in another verse, Hold o'er my spirit absolute sway. And a moment and a point in my life, I got down on my knees before God on a Wednesday night at the sitting room uh, settee. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to get saved. I don't know what it's going to mean to get saved. But Lord, I want you in my life. I need you in my life. And I can honestly tell you, whenever I was a teenager, I used to have a fear of dying and going to hell. But you see, whenever that night came, I became so aware that I was a sinner that it offended God by my life and by my living that I knew I deserved to be lost. And you see, when you get there, you're glad there's someone to help you. I can remember that so clearly. The moment I invited Jesus Christ into my life, caring not what people would think or say, It was as if a real liberty, a a real burden was lifted off my soul and I felt absolutely free. I felt as if someone had switched the light on in my mind and I could see spiritual truths that I had been blind to all my life. I felt that I was new. I was clean. I felt forgiven. Do you know that the most important word in your experience is forgiven? What good is amazing grace? What good is the God so loved the world? What good is the cross if for you, you're not able to say you're forgiven? I was forgiven. And immediately this song popped into my mind. And it was this, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me, he talks with me, with me a long, nice, narrow way. And I went into work the next day, and I was singing, he lives. He li-. And they were all looking at me, like I wasn't working amongst orange men. I was working in the Republic of Ireland, a wee bakery. And I was working in a very difficult place, and the, there was a godless place. And I'm singing hymns, and they're looking at me, see what's, what, what's, as if I've got two heads. And then they knew I'd got saved and they were saying, Galandas has got religion. I hadn't got religion. I got a relationship. I wasn't trying to have, I hadn't entered into something that was performance related. I had entered into something that was relationship related. I'd fell in love with Jesus. He'd fell in love with me. He'd shown his love to me and I was new. I was new. And they started taking their own bets. See how long it would last. Well, it's, 40 some odd years ago and I'm still on the, I still haven't recovered from that night that I sought Christ remember Benada just to bring you up to date I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to go over long because I have to be somewhere else in the next 20 minutes um, but I can remember at a missionary convention Michael Ross Watson was speaking and I said Lord whatever that man has I want because I was now a private Christian, I was a quiet Christian, I was a self-serving Christian, and I, but, but I, I wanted to serve the Lord. And the next thing, I was at this meeting, and, and, and Michael Ross Watson speaking, and I said, Lord, that man's got some dynamic about his life, and, and if he makes an appeal, I'm going to respond to that appeal. I thought it would be lift the head or lift the hand job, between you, me, and God, and nobody else, because I was embarrassed about my spiritual walk with God. That's how it would come out as. And of course, I wondered, I was in this meeting in Monaghan and there was 200 nosy Christians. Are you ever in a meeting where there's 200 nosy Christians? Were you? Everybody wants to see them. Every time somebody comes in through the door, 
you, you, you know that? Well, here I am in this meeting, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, uh, uh, and I'm, how can I get to the front, and how can I respond to God? Because I promised God that I want to respond, and all of a sudden he says, well, if, you, if God has been speaking to you and you want to get right with God or you want to know God in a deeper way, he said, I want you to get out of your seat and come to the front. And then I started to plan, how can I get up to the front of this nosy meeting without anybody seeing me? Well, God had other plans because I got up out of my seat and tripped over half a dozen chairs and every eye was locked on me. That was the best thing ever happened to me. Because you wouldn't know me today had I not had that encounter with God today, then. Let me bring you right up to date. Right up to date. June of last year, uh, I was going through some difficult things. And, and I felt that my time in Abbot's Cross was coming to an end. But try to stick in as long as I could to make sure. Listen, you pray for your pastor because pastoring is not easy. Everybody wants the pastor to do it their way. I used to say that I had 350 bosses. And I had 350 headaches. And so... Uh, so uh, things didn't improve uh, and I'm no spring chicken look at me I was born in the 1950s so I'm no spring chicken I would have thought well no, you, you need to start thinking of taking it easy and you need to you know, take your ease and, and, and slack off a wee bit and, and, and do something less demanding and, and all of these thoughts are going through my mind and I'm thinking in the next three or four years, you know, you could maybe uh, retire and whatever. But you know, God had other plans. I'm not going to tell you how, I'm not going to take time. I haven't got the time. And it's not because Ian's put me under pressure. I just haven't got the time. But I want to tell you this. As, as I was, uh, uh, these things were working out in my life, I, I finally uh, uh, wrote my resignation at the, at the end of, sorry, at the end, yeah, the end of December, give my notice to the church on the 2nd of January because I felt that my ministry there after 12 years and one month was over. Before that, I had applied for two van jobs and got them in October. I was so disillusioned. Not with people, not with church work, just I was in turmoil in my own soul. But I asked to say, can you see yourself driving a van? And I said, no. Could you see me driving a van? Ian, could you see me driving a van? Not a hope. And I couldn't see myself driving a van. A young couple came to the church, they wanted me to marry them. It was Jack uh, Anderson and Catherine Henderson, I'm sure you've had her here. And, and way back in June of last year, which is another event that happened last June, will you marry us because we've got no pastor? I said, yes. Come and see me in September. We'll do a marriage preparation course, which I do with all people who are getting married. When they were there, I said, Catherine, I know you're from Lauren Mission Hall, so you're a youngster when I was there. Uh, I says, uh, Jack, but you're a Presbyterian because you look like one. And, and of course, uh, of course uh, that was not true. Jack went to Kulibaki Elam. He said, would you come and preach in our place? I said, I would. If you're not got a pastor, you need to ask him first. He said, we don't have a pastor. I went and I preached on December the 4th. The leadership of Cullibach Elam contacted me on December the 5th. Uh, I met with them again on December the 12th. And they gave me a unanimous call to the ministry there on that night. And what has happened since the 5th of February, where we took up the post, has been beyond my wildest imagination. I'm happier now in the work of God than I've ever been. I'm more fulfilled now in the work of God than I've ever been. And I'm so thankful to God that whenever we think of making plans... God has a wonderful way of bringing his plans into view. Are you following God's plan for your life? 
What will it take for God to bring you to a place where he can use you? Let's bow together in prayer before we sing two verses of our closing hymn. Father in heaven, as we meditate, ponder on the the amazing grace of God and how you work in our lives, Father in heaven, we pray that you'll grant unto us that each one in this meeting, bowed in your presence, Lord, will give thanks to God for his amazing grace. Lord, I ask that you will meet in the, move in the hearts of every soul. Lord, help us to realize that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by the amazing grace of God who gave his Son to die in our place and in our stead that we might have our sins forgiven. And as we, as we come in repentance and faith and rely upon the work of the cross, Father, we pray that you will speak right into our being and cause, Lord, a, 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 an interest, an urgency within the soul, Lord, to get right with you now. And it might be just as you're about and hear my voice, you've never settled the question. You could settle it now. And here's what you could say, Lord, I've heard your voice tonight. I know I'm a sinner. I've offended you. I've been born on the wrong side of the... I've been born on the broad road and not the narrow road. But Lord, here and now, I step off that broad road and they get on to the narrow road. If you would do that, then it's up to God, and to, uh, uh, between you and God, as to how and where he does with your life. But it'll be the best move that you've ever made. Father, we pray that you give wise heads and give urgency and desire within every heart. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder, can we sing the first and the last verse of I Hear Thy Welcome Voice? And Ian, if you want to come and close the meeting, is that all right? I don't know what number it is. 330. 330. First and the last verse, sister, if that's all right. And Ian, if you would close the meeting, or if you would, I'd go down here and shake hands with people, all right? Thanks. Father in heaven, we thank you for this hour together this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your servant and for what he has shared with us here. Lord, heartfelt things. Lord, we thank you that what you did for him, you can do, Lord, for all here. And sometimes, Lord, we know that... that uh, it may, may mean that we may have to uh, experience pain and suffering before we come to an end of ourselves. And Lord, we pray that all in this place tonight might be holy and fully saved, ready to meet God, 
that they too, Lord, will know Jesus Christ as their Savior, even as Trevor does and his wife Esther. And Lord, for those of us who do, we pray indeed that we, Lord, might be open and willing and find doing the will of God, whatever it may be for each and every one of us, recognizing that there is no better place to be in and to be serving than to be doing your will. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Bless Trevor as he departs here shortly, Lord. And we pray that, Lord, if there is any here who has responded, who wants to know more, Lord, who would want to seek your face tonight, that, Lord, perhaps they might speak to Trevor on the way out, or maybe even myself, maybe even wait behind that we might be able to counsel and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.